Hello everybody, Robert Breaker here, a missionary evangelist of the Spanish and English speaking people. Uh, it's good to be here with you today and be able to give you another sermon. Every week, Lord willing, I come to you in English and Spanish with a new sermon. And uh, today's sermon, let me just uh, get this out there, okay? Let me just get this straight before we be begin. I understand that is bad grammar, okay? Before those people come out and attack me, and they do, and they will for any little reason, and so I have to be very careful and make sure that what I do is right, because I sure know I'm going to get it if it's not. But I want to make sure you know, you never end a sentence with a preposition. I can just hear in my voice my Aunt Susie, never end a sentence with a preposition. <laughs> and of course, in school and grammar school. So I'm ending this with in. But I thought about it for a while, and I thought, you know what? No, uh, it's free country, freedom of speech. I can do it the way I want. Okay, so let me start off by saying I understand that it's bad grammar, but I chose it anyway because of the message. And I really want to emphasize that trusting in something is what saves us. So what are you trusting in? So I chose to use bad grammar today <laughs> in order to try to get my point across. I could have put in what do you trust or in what trustest thou or in what are you trusting? I probably should have added, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? But that would have been a little bit longer. But I just settled on, what are you trusting in? Okay? And I want it to be personal, and I want this to be about you. What are you trusting in? So let me just make sure I get that out at the beginning of this message. Yes, I know my grammar is bad. Okay? I did that on purpose, just to emphasize the fact that you need to be trusting in something. Unfortunately, there are many people out there that are trusting in the wrong thing. So, that's what we're going to look at today. What are you trusting in? Dot, dot, dot. There are some things that people are trusting in. So I guess it's an elliptical clause, really. It's not bad grammar because I have an elliptical clause following it. So maybe maybe my grammar's good. I'll leave that up to the, to the English um, majors to figure out. But, um... I'm going to be asking this question today, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? There are a lot of people that are trusting in something, but it's the wrong something. And what I want to do today is I want to take you to the Bible and show you what the Bible teaches is the thing that you are to trust in to get to heaven. Also, at the end of this sermon, God gave me a great illustration the other day when I went surfing a hurricane. And I can't wait to get to the end and give you that illustration. So hang in there for the end of this sermon to get that illustration. And hopefully this will be an evangelistic message. If you're not saved, I hope you get saved. If you are saved, I hope this will help you as you go out and try to win others to Christ. Make sure you put the emphasis in what God makes as the emphasis. The blood of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be trusting in. Now, and I'll get to that, but I just want to show you what other people are trusting in and how that doesn't save you. You must trust in the blood to save you. A lot of people are trusting in the wrong thing. I want to teach you today the right thing to trust in. So let's start with Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Every morning in my life that I can remember as a kid here in this house, we moved here when I was two, I would get up and I'd go sit at the counter and I'd eat breakfast. I had my own little area uh, over here on the side of the counter with a little stool and I'd always eat my breakfast. And right there on the wall was these two verses. Mom had a little plaque. Now that plaque isn't there anymore. I don't know what happened to that plaque, but it's kind of funny. It hung there so long that the wall, you can see where it was. It's like the wall faded around it, except for there. And you can vaguely still make out that little square where this little picture was with this verse from a King James Bible. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Every day since I was a kid, till I was about 14 years old, I remember waking up, and going and sitting down and eating my cereal, and looking up and reading that verse over and over and over. And it's a wonderful verse. I wish I would have heeded it as a child. I didn't get saved till I was 18 years old. But I wonder if God didn't plant that verse in my heart to remind me, hey, it's about trust. It's about believing. It's about faith. It's all about the Lord. And it's from the heart that you believe in Him, not just from the head. So I've always loved these two verses of Scripture. These are probably some of the first verses I ever learned as I read that every morning eating. So what I want to do today is I want to ask you, what are you trusting in? 
What is it that you are trusting in? Is it your dot, dot, dot? And what I'll do is I'll put up here, a lot of people are trusting in the wrong thing. A lot of people are trusting in, in themselves or in what they've been taught or what they have, but they're not trusting in the Lord and what He did. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ came and He died on the cross for our sins. And the Bible tells us that the focal po point of the Bible is the death of Christ. It's what Jesus did to save us. It's not what we do to get to heaven. So it's all about this right here, the cross of Calvary. When the most important thing that was ever needed was done for the history of the world, the redemption of mankind, when Jesus shed his blood. And it's all about that shed blood that saves us. So that's what I point people to in my messages, is it's to Christ. Trust in the Lord. Who is Jesus? He's the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto the own understanding. That's what our trust is supposed to be in, is in the Lord. And what the Lord did for us. It's what He did that saves us, not what we do. It's what He did. Amen? But a lot of people, especially under the law, are trusting in what they did. Or, or even today, well, Old Testament, what they did. But today there are people that are trusting in what they do. They don't understand. They don't rightly divide. There's a lot of people that still think we're under the Old Testament law. And they say, well, if I do this, if I do that, what are they doing? They're trusting in themselves and not in the Lord. And that's what I want to get to today. There are a lot of people out there, I think I have seven or eight points, that are trusting in something other than what Jesus did, other than the Lord. They're not trusting in what he did for them. They shed blood. They're trusting in something they do. So without further ado, let's get started today. There's a lot of people out there that are trusting in their own worldview. A lot of people out there think, oh, I don't believe in God in the Bible. But you can't go one verse in the Bible without seeing that the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But there are people all over this world that go, no, 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 no. They're like little children. They put their fingers through their ears and they say, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. Okay, so you say, well, well, what are you trusting in? What do you believe? And a lot of the times they say, well, I believe in evolution. Because the only alternative to creationism is believing in evolution. The only alternative to the belief in God is the belief that there's no God. Okay, well, if there's no God, then how did everything get here? Uh, I know, I'll go to science. Science, what is your worldview? What do you tell me? And science says, well, nothing exploded, and that's how we got here in the Big Bang. There is nothing more unscientific than the lie of the Big Bang. Because you've got the first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics is all matter can neither be created nor destroyed. All right? The only way there can be what we have here is a supernatural creator creating it outside of the law. Because the law of science, thermodynamics, is it can't just suddenly appear. <laughs> and yet scientists try to tell you, but it just blew up one day and here we are. And you go, what blew up? And they go, nothing. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me see if I can understand this. Nothing exploded and that's where everything came from? Do you understand how literally idiotic that sounds? That is the most unlogical thing that a man could say that nothing exploded. You understand you have to have something in order to have an explosion. There must be some sort of an accelerant. You can't just look at your hand and go, oh, there's nothing in my hand. Boom! Oh, it exploded! If there's nothing there, then it couldn't explode. If it did explode, then it means there was oxygen there or, or some other sort of accelerant. So to say that nothing exploded and we all came from nothing is one of the dumbest statements that anyone could ever make. And yet they want to be called scholars. They want to be called scientific. They want to be called uh, men of high degree and smart. And yet that goes against the very teaching of what they say. What does God say about such people that believe in a worldview? Well, God says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. <laughs> Psalms 14.1. That's kind of funny. God's kind of going, you're kind of foolish, aren't you, to say there's no God. Because science itself cannot explain creation. They have to go to an unscientific extreme and say, well, we think that nothing blew up, and that's how we got here. 
No, you just taught me that the first law of thermodynamics is matter can neither be created nor destroyed. So how are you telling me that there was nothing, but it just suddenly exploded and now there's something? It takes more faith to believe in the evolution theory and the Big Bang than it does to have faith in God and just believe, no, no, intelligent design. There was a designer that designed all this. You start looking at DNA. You start looking at, at, at molecules. You start looking at atoms. There's no way that this thing came about by accident. There was a divine creator who was an intelligent designer who designed all of this. You look at an atom. An atom is a proton, neutron, and electron. The electron spinning around that atom. If that electron ever just stopped, those two would separate. They would explode. So that thing has to keep them together to keep them from exploding. But you see, it exists. It can explode, but it exists. Nothing can't make something. I, I can't say it enough, but yet there are people in this world that want you to believe, no, belief in God is stupid. And you go, yeah, but everywhere I look, I see intelligent design. I see the stars in heaven. And it's amazing how they just seem to happen in such a way that they mark events in the history of the world. Doesn't that prove that God created it? And like he said in the Bible, he put them as markers and for signs and TNC. No, no, that was just accident. Oh, 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 okay. You mean just like the Big Bang, a big accident where nothing exploded? No, it's not the same. The only thing that can answer the question of where do we come from is an intelligent designer, a creator, God. Now, what are you trusting in? Well, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2. Let me show you what the Bible says about these people. Jeremiah 2. As a thief is, is ashamed, I'm in verse 26. As a thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets. Now, look at verse 27. Saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. It's interesting how here in this passage of Scripture, God is, is chastising Israel and saying, why would you say such a dumb thing? Hey, a stone is what brought us forth. But is that not what evolution teaches? That we're just a cesspool of chemicals that over billions of years rained on a rock, and all these little minerals fell off a rock and became little organisms, and oh, a single cell, and then a multi-cell, and then a monkey, and then us? What a silly thing. Your uncle's a monkey? You know, to me, that's an insult. To an evolutionist, they believe that's true. That's silly. That's silly. What does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says there's a God. If there's a God, a creator, then there's also the judge. So the, the Lord is God. The Lord is the creator. And the Lord is the judge. And someday he will judge everyone. It doesn't matter if you believe in the Bible or not. Someday you will. Because someday you will give account. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Someday you will stand before the judgment, the creator of all things, and he will judge you. And uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, I just didn't know? That's no excuse. You had a Bible. You could have read it. Uh, you're going to try to say, no, 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 but nothing exploded. <laughs> God's going to go, no, I was there. Yeah, I even told you in the first verse of the Bible, I'm a witness. I was there. And, uh, yeah, nothing can explode. No, I created it all from outside, and then I set up the rules. And if you just thought for a little bit, you would have known it. But there's a lot of people trusting in their own worldview. They're trusting in what they were taught in college and saying, well, I believe this, I believe... And they don't sit down and think about it too much. But you need to think about it. Now, there's some people in this world that they sit around and they think, well, I am important. I'm worth something. So I'm a good person, and, and look how great I am. And I tell you what, if anybody deserves heaven, it's me, because I am worth so much. I give to the poor, I do this. Why? And I was born in one of the families, you know, that goes way back. And look at me, I, I'm one of the certain political families. And, I, and there's a lot of people like that that think that they're worth something. You know, a lot of people, they call that self-esteem. Nowadays, they go around, they teach you self-esteem. Say, well, you got to realize you're worth something. You're, you, you need... A lot of times what that does is makes people full of pride. And pride is the enemy of God. The first sin in the world was pride. Lucifer was full of envy and pride and sinned against God. You can't get to the point where you think you're worth so much that you're worth more than other people. No, we're all the same. And what does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible tells us there's none good, no, not one. 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You think you're worth something? You think you're better than other people? You know, a lot of people use the word blue bloods. You think you're a blue blood? You think you're better than me? No, we're all in the same boat. Nobody's better than anybody else. Matter of fact, what does the Bible say in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You think you're so great, do you? Think you're worth so, so much? You think you're better than anybody else? You're not. No, the Bible says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. You're a sinner. I have bad news for you. You might think you're something, but in God's eyes, you're just a low-down, filthy, dirty sinner that needs to be cleaned. I hate to say it, but it's true. Psalms 94, 11 says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men, that they are vanity. You think you're worth something? You're not worth much. Now, in God's eyes, you are worth enough for Him to come and die in your place and shed His blood for you. So your soul has value to God. You're worth something to God. But you don't deserve heaven because you think you're worth something. And yet, in the world we live in, there's a lot of people like that. They run around and they go, well, I'm, I'm a good person and I'm great and, 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 and I come from a good family. and, I, and I, I'm, I, well, well, I just deserve. Oh, you deserve something, do you? Do you know what? You're a sinner. And what you deserve is hell. Because your sins put Jesus on the cross. You are guilty of deicide. You're guilty of killing a king. Worse than that, you're guilty of, of killing God. You aren't worth more than anybody else. We're all in the same boat, and we all need to find cleansing from our sin. Well, there's a lot of people out there that they think, Oh, I'm so great, and they think they're so smart. And so a lot of people out there, they're trusting in their wisdom. And they say, well, you see, I'm too smart to be a religious person. I'm too smart to allow myself to become part of some cult or something like that. Well, I'm just so smart. You see, I've read a lot of books. And, I'm, and what are they trusting in? Their own wisdom, their own brain. They're saying, I'm just the smartest person in the world, so I'm too smart. Yeah, so, Mr. Smarty Pants, let me ask you this. You ever read the Bible? A lot of these people that think they're so smart, they've never read the Bible. If you're really smart, then why don't you do this? Why don't you read the Bible? Then tell me how smart you are. I met a lot of people that said, I thought I was so smart. I thought I came from a good family. I thought I was a good person. Why, I, I, my worldview was just what I was taught in college. And then I read the Bible, and then I got saved. And I realized that all that was a lie. <laughs> yeah, a lot of these people like this are the people that have never read the Bible. Have you ever read the Bible? Then what makes you an expert on it? You know, a lot of people that are lost run around and say, the Bible's a lie, it's written by man, it's written by man. You go, really? Have you ever studied it for yourself? Have you ever read it? Well, no, but, but I'm smart, and I can tell you. Do you have no room to talk if you've never even read it? <laughs> Who are you to tell me that the Bible's wrong, and you've never even read it? And yet you want to run, run around and brag about your Ph.D.? Uh, what does that stand for? Post hole digger? <laughs> and your degrees and all this? You're not wise. True wisdom is knowing the mind of God, not the mind of man. Amen? Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, the Bible says this, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And there's a lot of people out there that think they're so smart, and they're trusting in their smartness. Well, I'm street smart, I've heard people say. I might have never gone to college, but I got street smarts. And, I'm, and they're trusting in their own smartness. You know what the Bible says? You're a fool. The Bible says you're not smart. You're wise in your own conceit. You're deluded. You've deluded yourself into thinking you're smart. When true smartness, true wisdom is coming to God, the Creator, and saying, Hey, what don't I know? Let me know. Teach me. Well, that's what the Bible's for. Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. Do you read the Bible? We're all going to die someday. Can't get to heaven on your own wisdom. You need to know the wisdom of God. Proverbs 26, 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There's more hope of a fool than of him. But I've met these birds. I've met people like this that think they're so wise, that think they're so smart, and they say, they say things like, well, yeah, you're one of those Bible thumper people. Yeah, you, you think you know everything. You don't know nothing. Well, I've been around. I've seen this. I've read books. I, and it's just like, 
Yeah, how, there's more hope of a fool than you, the Bible says, because you're trusting in your own wisdom. You think, here's the problem, you think you're smarter than God. Man, I'd hate to be in your shoes. Could you literally imagine going to the judgment and standing before God and being judged for your sin and then trying to tell God, yeah, but I know more than you. <laughs> Poor person. Boy, I'd hate to be in your shoes. No, the, the most intelligent and wise being in all the universe is God, not you. Not you. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 21. Isaiah 5 21 says, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. There's people out, out there that say, I'm just so smart. I'm the smartest person in the world. And they pride themselves on how smart they think they are. But God says, No, no, woe unto you. Better be careful when the Bible uh, says woe, it means you're going to have woe. You're going to have sorrow. You're going to have problems. You're going to have uh, suffering. You're going to go through things, especially thinking that you're smarter than God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 18 through 20, we read this. 1 Corinthians 3, 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Why? Verse 19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise of their own craftiness. Verse 20, And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. See, a lot of people run around and say, I'm a philosopher. I, I believe in philosophy, and I, I have all the intelligence, and I have all this wisdom from the world, and I've read all the great philosophers, and I've read the Harvard class, and, I've, and I, 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 and they're just vanity. And they think they're so smart, and God up in heaven is looking down on them and going, <laughs> Gabriel, get a look at this. This guy thinks he knows something. <laughs> Why? Because they're trusting in their own wisdom rather than trusting in the Lord. Remember our first verse, Proverbs? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thy own understanding. But a lot of people, why? They're just fleshly, vain people trusting in men rather than trusting in God. Well, then you have these people that trust in their own wallet. They trust in their riches. They trust in money. And there's a lot of people out there like that. But why you meet somebody that's born into a rich family and they have a big trust fund while they just spend money like 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 it's nothing and oh, I'm rich. I can do whatever I want. And, and you know, there's people out there like that and they trust in their riches. Well, some of them are frugal. Some of them might um, be able to take money and, and not let it abuse them and, and control them. But sadly, most people like that end up in sin, end up in wickedness, end up in drug overdose and die, end up in, in doing evil things, end up eventually losing it all. Uh, my dad used to say, God showed what he thought of money by the kind of people he gave it to. <laughs> I always remember that. See, we're not rich people, and, I, and, and it's great to have money. But you shouldn't trust in money. And here's the problem. A lot of people today, they say, well, if I could just get my 401k up, if I could just work hard enough, if I could just save up this, if I could just, then I could retire. And you get all this money saved up to retire, and then you get sick and it all goes to the doctor because you're having to pay for all the doctor bills. Or something happens and, and, and you lose your money. Or, or you gamble it away. Or you, and you can't trust in money. You're supposed to trust in the Lord. Now, it's good to have money, but you can't trust in money. But there are people out there that are trusting in their wallet. Proverbs 11.4 Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Oh, you might be rich. You might have a lot of money. But what's that going to profit you when you die? As soon as you die... You're penniless. And where will you end up? What about the day of wrath? What about judgment? Do you think that uh, you can buy your way into heaven? <laughs> it's not going to work. No, see, you can't trust in riches. Psalm chapter 49, verse 6 and 7 says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. You cannot buy your way to heaven. It's impossible. But there's people on this earth that go, well, I'm just trusted in my money. Look at that. I've got trust fund. I've got millions in the bank. And I've got this. And I've got that. And look at my big mansion. And look at all the money I have. Well, goody, goody gumdrops. Good for you. You're rich. But what do you have in the afterlife? 
Oh, I don't think about that. Well, I, well I'm, I'm wise. I don't think there is a heaven or hell. Oh, really? You ever been there? Did you ever find out? Have you ever seen somebody die? I saw my father die. I know he went to heaven. I'm not going to explain what I saw or what I felt and everything that I saw that he died. But I know he went up to heaven. I've talked to people that saw other people die. And I've read books where people were there when people died. And a lot of your famous atheists died screaming. I've got a book back there on the shelf. Something to the effect of last words of saints and sinners. And a lot of famous atheists die. And as they're dying in their bed, they're tossing, they're turning, they're going, I feel the fire! I feel the fire! Make it stop! It's burning me! And they die. Really? You think you're so wise? There's no heaven, no hell. Then how come so many people in this world died, and as they're dying, they say, I feel like I'm falling, and I'm burning, and I'm burning. Testimony of people dying and going to hell. Other people die. I can see Jesus. I see him. I see him. I'm going up. There's a heaven and there's a hell. doesn't matter what you think. What matters is the Bible is true, and people who over the last thousands of years died have seen it. As they die, they're able to see into the spirit world and talk about what they see. Look at uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. So you're rich. Well, good for you that you have a lot of money. But that can't buy you salvation. A lot of people in this world think, I'll just buy whatever I want. Yeah, but you can't buy a place in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. See, silver and gold can't buy you redemption. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's the blood that redeems us, not your money. But a lot of people out there, they think, well, I'll, I'll just get a lot of money and I'm trusting in my money. And well, with my money, I'll do this, that, or the other thing. Money is great. It's a wonderful thing to have money. But you're never, ever, according to the Bible, supposed to trust in your money. You're supposed to trust in the Lord. In fact, in Timothy, we read, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You don't trust in your riches. You just don't. That's what the Bible says. You have to trust in the Lord. Well, there's other people out there. They trust in their own way. And they say, well... I know what you're saying, but I've never read the Bible. But, I, you know, I think there's a heaven. I think there's a heaven somewhere out there. And I think, you know, karma's going to get you. So you do good in this life, well, good will come to you in the next. If you do bad, bad. So, I, well, I, I found a way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do it my way. Oh, Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. But you know what the Bible says? <laughs> Let's go to Proverbs 14, 12. You see, there's a lot of people out there that think, well... Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I think there's probably a heaven and a hell. So I'm going to do the best thing I can. I'm going to do the best way I know how. I'm going to try to get to God. You know, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I've heard preachers say this, and I still to this day do not like this. Every time I hear a preacher say this, I cringe. Because this is not Bible. But yet they say it. I've heard them say it from the pulpit. And I, I want to go up to the preacher after and say, hey, brother, maybe you shouldn't say that. But I haven't yet. Maybe I will. But it's just wrong to say this. I've heard preachers say, if you want to come to, to salvation, if you want to be saved, come to Jesus the best way you know how. And I just, I just go, no. I don't see that in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the best way you know how. The Bible says here in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What if the best way you know how is the wrong way? You see, there's the Bible way and there's your way. Your way leads to hell. You must come to God the Bible way. Jesus Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There's one way to heaven, and it's the way God said, and it's through the blood atonement of Christ. It's through faith and trusting in what Jesus did. I cannot believe that there's pastors out there that say, just come to God the best way you know how. What if that way that you think is how is the wrong way? Then you're going to go to hell like a bullet. No, don't come to God the way you think. 
Come to God the way He said. See, you've got to trust in the way He said. Trust in His Word. Trust the Bible. Don't come to God in your way. See, a lot of people out there, they're trusting in their way. A lot of Hindus. Well, I believe that through Hinduism, I can do this, that, or the other thing. Other, others believe, ah, through reincarnation. Well, if I do good, my way is to be uh, reincarnated through another. And, and there's a lot of different ways that people say you can get to heaven. But what is the right way? Well, let's look at Psalms 37, verse 5. I'll show you a couple more verses here. But there's only one way to heaven. You can't come to God your way. You've got to come the way God said. And that's the way through the blood. Through the blood of Christ. Forgiveness through the blood. And I'll get to that here in a minute. But Psalms 37 and verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. You don't trust in your way. You know, it's not the best way you know how. No, it's the way God said. And He has a way. And He is the way. And you must come through His way, which is through faith in the finished work that He did for you for salvation. Let's go to 2 Samuel 22. I just try to give you scripture today. I care about you. I want to see you saved. I want to make sure that you're trusting in the right thing, not in the wrong thing. Because sure as the world, there's a lot of people out there trusting in the wrong thing. Thinking, well, if this is what I do, or if I do that, or the other thing, then I'll get to heaven. And they're trusting in their way, and not God's way. In 2 Samuel 22, we read this. 2 Samuel chapter 22, and verse 31. Great verse. 22, 31. As for God, His way is perfect. See, man's way is not. It seems like our way is always messed up. Because we're sinners, and the best we can do will never please God. So we got to come the way that He set up for us to be saved. And what does it say there? It says, His way is perfect. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to them that trust in Him. How about it? Are you trusting in Him for salvation? Or are you trusting in your worldview, your worth, your wisdom, your wallet, or your way? I've heard people say, well, you know, I've heard all that before, but, but I believe it's like this. And so I'm going to follow this path, and I'm going to do it my way. All right, well, I'll see you at the judgment. I hate it for you, but that's not the way of salvation. You went the wrong way. You have to come the way God says. Now, there's others out there that think it's by works. And there's others out there that say, well, you know what? I, I'm a good person, and I do this, and I do that. And, and you know, I, because I'm so good, well, I just think God ought to accept me. Well, here they come back over here thinking they're worth something, and God ought to accept them because of what they have done. Are we saved by works? No. That's not what the Bible teaches. Not today. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Salvation is by faith, not of works. Over in Romans chapter 4 and verse 5, we see this again, and this is the message that Paul is preaching in Acts 13, 38, 39, that we're not saved by the works of the law. We're saved by what Jesus did. It's what Jesus did. Over in Romans chapter um, 4 and verse 5, we read, But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You see, it's not works. Under the Old Testament, God demanded some works. And they were thinking, oh, if I do these works, then God will accept me. And that was a different dispensation. Today we're saved by faith, not works. We're here today, not back there. So it's not our works that save us. Over in Titus chapter 3, another strong verse. But you see, there's people out there who claim to be Christians that believe that salvation is based upon what you do, your works. They're lost. They're trusting in themselves, and they're deluded. They're trusting in their works rather than the finished work of Christ. They're lost. Lost religious people. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So it's not our works that save us. It's the finished work of Christ. It's realizing that we're a sinner and we're not worth anything. That we can't, in our own wisdom, in our own way, try to get to heaven. We can't buy a way in heaven. We have to realize there is a God. And He is true. And He is real. And that God made the way of salvation. We've got to come through His way to be saved. This is the way. This is God's way of salvation. 
It's not our way that we try to get to God. It's whether or not we come to God the way that He made. And the way to salvation is through the door, Jesus Christ. Through the path that God set up. Through the blood shed for our sins. Trusting in what He's done for us. But you see, a lot of people get messed up. A lot of people go to the Bible and get into a denomination and they're taught in their denomination, well, you see, it's water baptism that saves you. Oh, really? <laughs> and what they'll do is they'll read parts of the Bible, but they won't read the whole Bible. And what they'll do, they'll go to Acts 2.38. They'll say, well, and look what it says in Acts 2.38. Why well, it says, you know, the baptism, and they say, see, water baptism. Um, I'm sorry, but there's a lot more in the Bible than just that. Acts 2.38 was the beginning of the book of Acts. And it did talk about water. You're right. But as you continue reading the book of Acts, you find out there's another guy named Paul. And God revealed to Paul the message of the blood. And it's all about the blood, and it's all about faith. And that's the revelation to Paul. You see, there's a lot more in the Bible than just Acts 2.38. But a lot of your people, they say, well, trust in your water baptism, and if you're water baptized, then you're saved. Let's look real quick. I don't have time to get into this, but let me show you something. These people don't rightly divide. And it's sad. I've met a lot of them. Uh, many of them go to what's called the Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ tells you, water baptism saves you. And you're like, uh, no, that's, no, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. If we're saved by water baptism, that's a work. So you're telling me we're saved by works? I just read you the verses. Not of works, lest any man should boast. What does the Bible say about water baptism? Well, John the Baptist came baptizing in water. Yes. And then the apostles of Christ did some water baptism. But then in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, look what Jesus says. This is Jesus. For John truly baptized with water, but she shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So Jesus says there's two baptisms. There's water and there's the Holy Spirit. Which is the one that's more important? Well, Jesus just said, well, there's this water one here, but that's back there. There's going to be over here a more important one. Well, you go through the book of Acts, chapter 10, you see some Gentiles get saved, and they're saved by faith. Not by water baptism, they're saved by faith alone. Afterwards, they get baptized in water, and in Acts 11, and verse 16, Peter says, oh yeah, then I remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost. You see, before, Peter thought, oh, it's the water, it's the water, but then he's like, oh no, no, I understand now, it's not the water, it's faith. Acts chapter 15, verse 11. Peter says that we believe we shall be saved by grace, even as they. Salvation is by grace through faith. You go to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, all right? Let's look at 1 Corinthians. God called later the Apostle Paul to go and preach and teach and to tell people how to be saved. And God revealed to Paul the gospel. Now, is the gospel of Paul get baptized in water and water saves? No. That's not what Paul teaches. Paul says he's our apostle, Romans eleven sixteen. 16. He says God revealed unto him the gospel of salvation that saves. All right? Look at what Paul says about water baptism. And you tell me if this is what saves us, water baptism. Paul says no. 1 Corinthians 1, 14, I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now, why would a man say that if water baptism saves? Why would he say, and thank God I only got these two guys water baptized, but thank God I didn't get every... Would he be saying, I'm thank God you guys didn't get saved? That's what it sounds like. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So, Paul says, I was not sent to you to preach to you that you're saved by water baptism. He says, I was sent to you to teach you that you're saved by the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And I'm going to read that to you here in a second. But look what he says. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Why? Because when you believe the gospel, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's the Holy Ghost baptism, not the water. Now it's the Holy Spirit, just like he said, uh, Jesus said. For the preaching of the cross, verse 18, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Power of God unto what? Unto salvation. What does Romans 1.16 say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we are not saved by water baptism. We're saved by the gospel. That's what Paul says. 
He says, I thank God I didn't baptize a lot of people because then they'd think they were saved by the water baptism. They'd be trusting in that rather than the gospel. No, I want to make it clear, Paul says, that it's not the water that saves you. It's the gospel and faith in it. And it's the power of God and the salvation. But a lot of people are deceived. A lot of people are trusting in their water baptism. I'm sorry, but that's a lost person. That's not someone who's saved. That's not someone who's trusting in what the Bible says to trust in. So the Gospels, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, what does it say? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the Gospel, which I preached unto you, by which also you've received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. So we are saved not by water, but by the Gospel. It's not the water baptism that saves you. Are you trusting in your water baptism? If so, I've got bad news for you. You're lost. You're not saved. You're only saved when you trust. Now, you can be baptized in water after you're saved, that's a completely different thing. You can do that. Many churches say, hey, you got to be baptized in water after you're saved in order to become a member of our local assembly. And if you want to do that, you help yourself. But it doesn't save you. It doesn't keep you saved. It has nothing to do with salvation. It's a symbol that you are saved by believing in the gospel. Have you believed the gospel? Are you trusting in the gospel? So the gospel is verse 3 and 4. First, I de For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures so it's all about how Christ died for our sins how did he die why he shed his blood how the gospel is all about how how through bloodshed without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins you see you've got to have that blood in order to be saved see it's not the liquid of H2O that saves us it's that liquid of the blood of God shed in your place for your sins. And do you trust that for salvation? Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that are trusting in their water baptism. And that's sad. That's sad. There's other people out there that see all this. And they've come to this point and they see all that. But they're still lost. Because today in the world in which we live, there's a lot of churches that do not teach the gospel. I've been talking on the phone this last week to a lot of people and they're telling me I can't find a good church. When I do go to a church, well, they never give the gospel. They just tell you, just repeat this prayer after me. Do you realize there's no such thing as the sinner's prayer in the Bible? Now there's a lot of verses that people try to twist and say, well, you see, the way to get to heaven is by words. <laughs> and you go, what? And they say, well, if you'll just repeat this prayer after me, well, you'll be saved. Where's that in the Bible? Where in the Bible does it say that you're saved by a prayer? by what you say or what you pray, it's not there. If you get a chance, go to my YouTube video. I have a video about the sinner's prayer. And I show you all the verses that people try to, try to take and say, this is the sinner's prayer. And every one of them, they twist out of context. It's, it's uncanny. They don't rightly divide. You see, you're not saved by a prayer. You're saved by believing in the gospel. Are you saved? Have you trusted in the blood of Christ? Unfortunately, I've met people in my life and what they do is they say, well, I think I'm saved, but I don't know. And I doubt it all the time. And I'm always wondering, did I get saved? Did I get saved? Am I saved? Am I saved? I say, well, you tell me. When did you ever hear the gospel? 99% of the time they go, uh, what's that? They've never heard the gospel. I say, all right, you tell me. Tell me your testimony of how you believe you got saved. And most of the time it's like, well, when I was three, I said, oh, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please save me. I said, okay. Well, then when I was 12, I did it again, and then again, every night I get down by my bed and I say, Oh, please, Jesus. And I've heard them say things like this. Did I say the right words? Maybe I didn't say the right words. I'll say them again. And so I'll say them, Oh, God. And there's people out there, and it's sad, who think that they're going to heaven based upon the words that they said. They are literally trusting in their prayer. They're trusting in their words, and they're not trusting in the gospel. I was one of those people from age 13 to age 18. My wife was one of those people. My father. I've met many people like that. We went to church most of our life, and we were instructed, if you want to go to heaven, we'll just repeat this prayer after me. Okay, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please send me. Amen. Amen. I did that every night from age 13 to 18, and I was lost and on my way to hell because my faith was in my prayer. I was trusting. I hope those words were heard by God. I hope I said the right words. I hope God heard me. Oh, I hope I'm going to heaven based upon my words. It wasn't until I was 18 years old that my dad showed me the gospel. And I saw what Christ did for me. And I realized, why was I trusting in my prayer? 
No, I'm going to trust in the propitiation. I'm going to trust in the blood of Christ. I'm going to trust in Him. Because I was trusting all these years. I think I'm saved. I ought to go to heaven. I'm, I hope so because I did the words. I repeated the words. Do you see the problem? And there's a lot of people out there that are deceived. They're trusting in their prayer. They're trusting in their words. And they're not trusting in the blood of Christ. And that's sad. I hate it. I, I want to help those people. I'm not condemning them. I'm not putting them down. But I'm telling you, if you're trusting in that instead of Christ and His blood alone, you're still lost. Okay? Quit trusting in anything that you do and trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto your own understanding and come to Him alone for salvation. Let's go to Jeremiah 7, 8. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 8. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. <laughs> There are a lot of people in this world that are trusting in their words that they say. A lot of people have been lied to and told, if you'll just repeat this little prayer after me, then you'll go to heaven. And I've met many of them. I, I could show you testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony that I've received in the mail, that I've received from uh, YouTube uh, uh, comments, that I've received from emails, that I've even received phone calls from people saying, Brother Breaker, thank you for your ministry. Thank you for being faithful to preach the gospel of salvation. Because I was one of those that went to a church that didn't preach the gospel, and they just kept telling me, well, if you want to get saved, just repeat this prayer. And so I do that. And then I wouldn't feel saved, and I'd go back, and I'd say, what's wrong? We'll just repeat it again. And then every night before bed, I'd say, oh, sinner's prayer. I'd look for another sinner's prayer. I, I prayed every sinner's prayer that I could find. And they said, and I still couldn't figure out, why don't I feel saved? Why don't I know that I'm going to heaven? And they say, but when you showed me the gospel, I realized I was trusting in what I did. I was trusting in what I said. I was thinking that it was the prayer that saves me. I didn't realize it's Christ that saves me through faith. And they say, thank you for showing me that. Well, you're welcome. Amen. I'm glad. I don't want you to trust in this because this doesn't save you. I want to point you to what you're supposed to trust in to get you to heaven, the blood of Christ. So there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. Please see my video about the sinner's prayer. I think it'll be a blessing. You're not saved by what you say or what you pray. Now, you can be saved when you pray. I met plenty of people that heard the gospel and understood, and they said, Lord, I come to you now as a sinner, and I trust what you've done for me. And they're saved right then. They were saved while they were praying, but it wasn't the actual prayer or the words of the prayer that saved them. Okay, And they weren't trusting in their prayer. They just told God, God, I believe it now. I'm trusting in it. And they were saved when they were praying, but they were saved by faith. They weren't saved by their words. They weren't saved by what they said. They weren't trusting in their prayer. So how are we saved? Well, the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Faith is believing. Believe. Faith is trust. We're all about trusting today. And the Bible tells us there's something we must trust in to be saved. Something we must believe. Our faith must be in something to be saved. In what? Not these things. So what must our faith be in? I looked up the word believe in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. I found it interesting because the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, the second definition said, believe means to expect, to hope with confidence, to trust. So to believe is to trust in something. What are we to trust in? I've showed you things that people trust in that don't save them. What is it that we trust in to be saved according to the Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. And in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, this is the verse that I got saved on. It's in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. When my dad took me through the scriptures and showed me the gospel, he took me to this verse. And this is when I finally understood and believed. Before that... I've been trusting in all these other things, thinking, well, in some way or another, maybe if I do all these things, maybe, maybe God will save me. You know, I was trusting in my works and my words and my water baptism, a lot of things, but they didn't save me. Then my dad took me here to Romans chapter 3, and verse 25 says, Whom God set forth to be a propitiation. That's like a substitute. It literally means the act of appeasing wrath. But how was a wrath of God appeased? Through the substitutionary blood atonement of Christ. Jesus died in my place for my sins. He was my substitute. 
through faith in his blood. There it is. You're saved by faith. For by grace you're saved through faith. Faith in what? Faith in the blood. So salvation, according to the Bible, is through faith in the blood. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the mission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. All this declares you righteous. And you say, well, I deserve heaven based upon what I did. Nope, not salvation. Salvation is by faith in the blood. Trust in the blood. Trusting in the blood. That's what the Bible says. You say, you mean you have to believe in that blood that was shed for you? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. It says it right there, through faith in his blood. Let's go over to Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. Romans 5.11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The Bible calls that shed blood of Jesus Christ the blood atonement. And that atonement that Jesus made through his shedding of blood was made on our behalf, and God asks us to put our faith in that atonement. And that's what the Bible calls receiving salvation. We receive through faith. We receive by believing. We receive by trusting in that blood atonement for the forgiveness of our sins. That's salvation. I looked up the word um, believe again as a verb. Now, the first time I found believe in the 1828 dictionary, that was a noun. And then I looked a little farther down, and the word believe in the 1828 dictionary as a verb is to have a firm persuasion. To believe is to trust. To place full confidence in, now watch this, to rest upon with faith. So trusting is resting by faith in something. I am resting in the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. The Bible says there in Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I'm saved through the blood of Christ. What Jesus did, not what I do, what he did. And I'm trusting in that blood. My faith is in the blood, Romans 3.25. And I know I'm saved. Before, I might have been trusting in one of these things. But I clearly see now, none of those saved me. The Bible teaches faith, belief, trust in the blood of Christ for salvation. Now, my last video that I posted, I went out and served Hurricane Marco. And I did that for you. I didn't get any good rides. Unfortunately, it was all closing out, so I didn't get too many rides. I want to go again, maybe in the next day or two, but the waves are almost gone now. Uh, we're at the tra tail end now of Hurricane uh, Laura. But while I was out there surfing, sometimes I'm out there, I'm thinking about my next sermon, I'm singing some hymns to myself. But I was out there in those big waves. And, and on the camera, they look so small. Uh, you can really see how big the waves were when I was up on the pier, zooming way out. And you saw that guy drop in, and he was he was kneeling down, and you could see the wave was still high up above him. And definitely those were six, seven-foot waves. Uh, and so you can't see it on the camera, but they're big. And so whenever we're out there surfing, a lot of times you can get sucked over the falls, we call it. You get pulled over the top of the wave, and you get pounded under, and the wave goes over you, and you're underneath going like this. And you're about to come up when the next wave comes and holds you under. And then the next wave, and the next wave. And it's very common to get stuck under two or three waves and not be able to get out. There's been many times in my life when I thought, well, Lord, this might be it. I'm, this is the third wave, and I really need a breath of air right now, and I barely make it up to go, <gasps> just in time to get sucked back under. That's happened many times. So it, it would be very easy to die out there surfing in those waves, especially when you've been out there for hours and you're very tired. But there's something that we surfers use. And while I was out there surfing, I got this illustration. And it just came to me. It was like the Lord was, was showing me this to preach on in this sermon. We have our surfboard, right? And we have our little fin at the back there. And on the surfboard, you have this little leash. The leash comes, and it comes down here on the bottom. And this little piece goes around your leg. And this is called the leash. And every surfer uses a leash. And that Velcro, actually, it's very a whole lot of Velcro, and it goes around your leg, and it doesn't come off. It's strong. Matter of fact, up here on the top, it's double Velcroed. And it's all about that leash. That leash is your lifeline. 
If you're pushed underneath that wave and you're down there and you're going, I need a breath, I need a breath, and you can't get up, you just kind of feel down to your leg and feel that leash and you just walk it up. And you walk up to that board and you grab that board and you pull yourself up and you go, <gasps> and you get the air you need. And if it wasn't for that leash, you probably drowned. Many times I felt like I was going to drown and then I said, oh, grab the leash and I pull that leash up and I get up and I get my breath. And I'm able to come back in, sit down, rest a little bit, and then paddle back out later. You know what my faith is in? My faith is in that leash. You see, I could fall off the board, and the board could go into shore if I didn't have a leash. And then how am I supposed to get in? But that leash keeps me connected. And that leash, no matter what happens, I know, all right, I got that leash. That's my lifeline. That's going to save me. I'm going to keep that leash. And, and, it, and it might take me down to where I'm about to die, but I can grab that leash. I can always find the top. And I'm trusting my complete faith, my trust, is in that leash while I'm out there surfing. And I thought about that, and I thought, isn't that interesting? A lot of people have emailed and asked me, Brother Breaker, how do you explain trust? How, how do you explain faith? Some people say, I want to be saved, but I just don't understand. What is faith? How... Well, all I can say is the greatest illustration that I found of faith is that leash. I go out in the big sea. I go out in the ocean. I go out in the water and there's big waves and there's storms and there's trials and there's things happening. And, and every day could be the last and I feel like, oh, I might die. But the only thing I know is in the back of my mind and in my heart, I'm not going to die because I have a leash. And I'm trusting that to save me. Yeah, I might get pushed under. I might feel like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to asphyxiate. I can't get a breath. But I can always use that leash. And I'm trusting that that leash is there and it's there to save me at all times. Same with salvation. The blood of Jesus Christ is my leash. And I'm not in this world much longer. I plan to be out of here soon at the rapture. Amen. Not before. I'm not before. I don't believe in taking your own life. Amen. Don't want to commit suicide for any reason. But in this world, sometimes the waves come in the form of suffering and temptations and problems. And I always know, well, I got the leash, I got the blood, and I say, Lord, pull me out of this and get me, get me through. And my complete faith is in that blood. Just like my faith is in that leash when I'm out surfing. So I just wanted to share that with you. I thought that was a neat illustration. At least I thought it was good. Because here I am out there, a lot of people are, oh, Breaker, you're crazy going surfing in these big waves. Why, well, you could have died. Nah, I'm not afraid. I don't have any fear. I didn't worry. I wasn't out there going, oh, this might be my last wave. No, I had faith. I was trusting in something to keep me out there alive, knowing that I would come back home to Mama and the kids. And that thing I was trusting in was that leash. Matter of fact, what's funny, the first leash that I ever had was red. <laughs> it reminded me of the blood of Jesus. A leash I have now is black. But uh, same with salvation. People say, do you know you're saved? Do you know you're on your way to heaven, Robert Breaker? Do you know for sure, beyond any shadow of a doubt, if you died, you go to heaven? I go, yeah. Yeah, I'm not afraid. Because I have a leash. I have the blood of Christ. And I'm trusting in that to get me to heaven. And I know it'll take me there. So my faith is in the blood of Christ. Well, there's my sermon. And I'll close with this. Are you saved? What are you trusting in? Yes, I know that's bad grammar because I ended in a preposition. But what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Are you trusting in any of these things? If so, you're still lost. You need to find the leash. Otherwise, you're going to go straight down when you die. And there'll be nothing to take you up. You need to find the blood. And you need to place your faith, your trust. You need to believe in the blood of Christ for salvation. And then you'll be saved. And then you'll be trusting in the right thing. All right, thank you so much. God bless you. Bye-bye. So we're out here at the tail end of Hurricane Laura. And I have my wife, Laura, filming. So Laura, meet Laura. <laughs> well, I thought I'd come out here today in order to show you my leash. So let me paddle up there. And I use the leash as an illustration of trust. So if I can get up there on that super high tide today. But I wanted to show you my leash. And when you're out surfing in big waves, it's scary. You could die. Uh, there have been many times in my life when I went under. And I was holding my breath and holding my breath and holding my breath. And I was like, huh, am I going to get out of here? If it hadn't been for that leash, 
I wouldn't be here today. So here's the leash. That Velcro holds very well. In this end, double Velcro. And that Velcro holding that leash together is what saves your life. So what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? I'm trusting the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the leash that gets me up, takes me to heaven. It's the only way I can get there. I can't save myself. I'm trusting in the blood.